Welcome to uh, the Hermius podcast. I think this is number 25. Uh, this is the after lunch meeting with the old folks. <laughs> so it's also uh, March. So it's Mustache March, which is why we look very hirsute today. Um, today we're going to uh, introduce uh, somebody that needs no introduction within the flight test community. Uh, a legend, Art Turbo Tomasetti, uh, is here with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about his career uh, and, uh, and about flight test in general. So uh, very quickly, let's uh, do some introductions. Turbo. Uh, Art Tomasetti, uh, Turbo. Yes, there's an origin story to the call sign. No, I will not share it. 28 years in the Marine Corps, started out as a Harrier pilot, went to test pilot school and got involved in several other things, one of which being the Joint Strike Fighter Program. Started off on the X-35 test team and from that point forward, the Marine Corps never really let me get far away from the program. Uh, finished my time as a F-35 instructor pilot before I got out and then six years working on the F-35 program at Lockheed Martin and retired from all of that in 2019 and trying to make this second retirement stick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Turbo. Nova. I'm uh, Jeremy Vanderhall. I go by Nova. I am a uh, Hermius test mm. pilot. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy, uh, F-16s, MQ-1s, test pilot school, did some uh, unmanned testing after that, and then back to TPS as a T-38 F-16 IP. Uh, out of active duty flying uh, Eagles in the Guard and FAA test pilot stuff. A couple of odds and ends jobs, and now I'm, uh, now I'm here at Hermes. And last but by no means leans. Yeah, uh, Chris Robert, go by Wigby. Uh, just over 20 years, just over 20 years uh, in the Air Force. <laughs> uh, started in the B 52, uh, about eight or nine years in, off to test pilot school. Uh, did tests in the B 52 and the B 1. Uh, went back and taught at test pilot school in a T-38 uh, and then had a chance to work from the program office on the requirements team uh, for the B-21 uh, and some development there. Back to Edwards for a few more years uh, working on large RPAs like the Global Hawk uh, and then finishing as a commander at the Operations Support Squadron. Uh, and then uh, finally figured out what I was going to do when I grew up uh, and came out to here uh, to Hermias uh, about nine months ago. Are you grown up? Uh, well... <laughs> On I'm the thinking way. about it. <laughs> On the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, so we're going to do what pilots love to do, which is talk about pilots <laughs> for this <laughs> podcast. And True. Uh, so the big thing is we all know that pilots are different um, from the general population. The two wing master race, as we used to love to call you guys in the Royal Air Force. Um, what makes a test pilot different from a pilot? Uh, I think, you know, it's obvious stuff, right? Test pilots, uh, shyer, more introverted, lower self-esteem, <laughs> constant need of positive reinforcement. You know, those are, those are the things that first come to mind. I mean, there's also the bigger watch, faster cars, better looking aspect of it. But I think the, the reality is that um, all pilots or test pilots start out as pilots in some way, shape or form. And probably the differentiating thing for, for most, because not everybody goes down this path, but most all go down the path, is a formal test pilot school attendance. Typically a year long, give or take, uh, where you learn not so much flying different airplanes, which you do get to do there, but you really hone your skill of being able to take what you know as a pilot, be able to talk airplane stuff as a pilot and translate that airplane stuff into engineer speak and be able to have that conversation with a set of pilots and a set of engineers to try and get everybody on the same sheet of music to figure out what is the airplane doing or what can it do better. Sure, cool. Yeah, I think to, to piggyback exactly what, what Turbo was talking about, um, one of the things that I had to learn in test pilot school uh, is that as a test pilot, I am perfect. <laughs> if, if I mess something up, it's not my fault, it's the airplane's fault. But the key is being able to explain to an engineer why it's the airplane's fault, what's wrong with it, so that they can fix it. Uh, and that whole mentality shift of, you know, I'm a type A guy, I want to fix it. If I mess something, it's my fault. Nope, not anymore. I'm perfect. It's the airplane's fault. So my low self-esteem thing just fell apart. <laughs> that, that okay. I think another aspect, uh, Turbo, to continue on what you said, right, the, the lexicon, we, we now have uh, a little bit bigger vocabulary to help 
me understand it and communicate it to the engineers of uh, what I think is right, wrong, good, bad about the airplane. Uh, and in some cases, uh, I'm not necessarily any better of a pilot than somebody that is flying hours and hours every week, every month, right? Day in and day out. Um, but I think just having kind of the breadth of experience uh, gives us a way to speak and understand, is this me doing it or is this the airplane doing it? And sometimes it's a little bit of both. So I think what I heard mainly from Nova is it's it's the it's not me it's you conversation. <laughs> you must be really good at breaking up with people. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but you know it's it's all it's all it comes from the heart. <laughs> but but like but for reals for a second though it, it's because um, you know at, by the time you get to test pilot school, you've you've shown that you have at least the bare minimum amount of skills in order to be a test pilot. But the reason that you are telling an engineer that that this airplane is broken for X, XYZ reasons is because you're designing the airplane for the brand new student pilot or the brand new wingman or the brand new co-pilot uh, that isn't able going to isn't going to be able to fall back on their years of experience because they don't have it. Right. So our job as test pilots is to try really hard to find where the airplane is broken so that when that brand new person that flies the airplane flies it, they don't, they're not test pilots for the first time. We've already discovered all the bad things and fixed it. And those are usually like the fun and exciting days. Like, yes, we found something that doesn't work <laughs> yeah. and now we can fix it. Yep. Uh, when everything goes like smooth, you're like, well, that was easy. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. And I agree. I mean, my time as a Harrier pilot, I, you know, was, Harrier had a, a not too outstanding uh, safety record, right? And I always thought the way to survive in that airplane was for me to be as good as I possibly mm -hmm. can. And it wasn't until I went to test pilot school and learned that, hey, you know, there's things we can do to the airplane to make it a little bit more human proof. Yeah. So I think I, I agree with you. Know, that's, that's spot on. Yeah. And I think maybe one of the other things, I think all of the test pilots I know, probably with the exception of one, have some engineering background before they ever qualify as a test pilot. So you've either gone to engineering school, uh, studies as, a, as an engineer, um, and then become a pilot or studied it as in some form. I think, as I say, I only know one who studied classics, uh, so he knows Greek really well, um, <laughs> but he's actually a pretty good test pilot. Um, so, yeah, good we, stuff. We talk to the engineers so that the other people don't have to. Also true. <laughs> I, and I think it, I like to sort of always say it's not our job to break the airplane, it's our job to show where the design lacks robustness. <laughs> uh, and I think there are days, as, as Wigby says, I think there are days when we actually test that robustness just, you know, right to the limit and, and not a single dot further. So, yeah, great fun. Thanks, guys. Um, very cool. Um, so uh, talking about test pilots and, and what we do and what you guys do and how we do flight test, um, let's talk about the law of X-planes and first flights and how we go about first flights and why they're different. Um, in our approach to a first flight buildup, yeah, um, the allure of X planes. I think. I mean, I think there's a generational sort of aspect to that. For <coughs> me, you know, I I was five years old when we landed on the moon, and those original astronauts, right? If you read the right stuff, you understand their backstory a little bit. So when I thought of test pilot as a youngster, I just assumed that the test pilots, what they did for a living, was go out and fly X airplanes, and that's sort of what I, from a age seven, I think that's what I said I wanted to do when I grew up. I said, cause I, and I didn't realize until I was a little bit on my way towards that goal that, hey, these X airplanes that I was so enamored with and thought that's what test pilots did, they don't make very many of those. Mm -hmm. And especially nowadays, they don't make very many of those. So I think that's, there's some aspect of it from generation is sort of what I grew up with and this, the mystique around test pilots and X airplanes were part of that. Um, and then, you know, the, the chance to do something that not many people get to do. Right. <clears throat> I think that's a big one for me as well. We'd be nervous. I've, I've never done a first flight. Uh, I'm excited to, I'm excited to do it for Hermius. Um, and hopefully learn, learn a lot of good, uh, lessons learned from, uh, from you turbos so that, uh, can uh, not have to repeat some of the mistakes that were made in the past from, you know, generations before. Yeah. I thought, uh, test by the school, uh, like two things. One did a really great job of bursting my bubble uh, towards the end when they sat us all down. They're like, oh, hey, by the way, um, 
you in uniform, you, you will never do a, a first flight. And we're like, what? Like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's the contractor pilot, you know, if it's a single seat or if it's a multi-seat, you know, like they did for the B-21, it was a contractor and a government uh, pilot in there. But, you know, don't expect to ever actually do that. Um, but, you know, then now here we are uh, and we're going to make this happen, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, is the plan this summer and, and it's going to be awesome. Um, the other thing was, you know, they, they've got a first, or at least when we went through, you know, they had a first flight type of uh, flight and academic aspect that you had to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's some lessons to pull from that. Uh, I think there's some good lessons uh, of ways like, no, we should definitely not do it that way uh, from that particular uh, course. I mean, they had some interesting and they were trying to pack, you know, standard TPS, right? They're trying to pack so much content into one event uh, that it almost becomes unrealistic of like, <laughs> hey, you have to do this huge stack of test cards. And oh, by the way, you've got 47 minutes because uh, someone's going to be watching uh, from like satellites or elsewhere. And, and you have to be in and out of the hangar during this amount of time. But inevitably, they, they put like all the safety, men's safety stuff you need right towards the end. And you're like, well, why don't we do that first? You know, which is probably one of the things they were trying to teach us. Um, and then, you know, like middle of the flight, it was, oh, no, you guys are about to, to fail because you're going to go over time. I was like, well, I'm not going to crash the airplane because I'm going to go over time and get seen now. Right. Like there's. There's a few levels uh, to that, I think, that are that are worth thinking about. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> this is not a, a classified program uh, yet, so so we can take the right safety precautions mm -hmm. uh, on the right timeline. Uh, but knowing that, like, there are deadlines, right? We, we have milestones that uh, we've got to hit uh, to show that you know we're we're serious about what we're doing, right? which right. we are. Yep, absolutely. And I think uh, you kind of mentioned in different ways the one thing that's really bigly, bigly different <laughs> about first flights and, and test flights that, that we're sort of attempting these days, and, and as you mentioned, Turbo, there's a lot less of them these days, but that's people are looking at you. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the first flights I've done with, with commercial aviation, the entire factory is out there. It's like there's 16,000 people looking at you, no pressure. <laughs> Um, so I think that's one of the big differences between, you know, what we do normally as, as, as engineers and test pilots is, is it's that public perception of what we're doing. You mentioned Apollo and, and growing up with Apollo, as did I. Um, but it's that fact that the entire world, uh, or in our case, probably, you know, a lot less than the entire world, but certainly a lot of people are going to be watching what we're doing. So See, that's that whole constant need of positive reinforcement. <laughs> well, Ramjet, I think you had a story previously where you're doing a test point and, you know, the, the people were sending you videos from the internet absolutely. before you even had the data. <laughs> yep, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, yep, thanks for the reminder. So uh, C-Series, when we were doing C-Series, we had uh, uh, a C-Series stalker uh, and he would fly around literally uh, watching what we were doing. And we were watching his video feed and I was watching telemetry on the ground, and I actually think I saw the gear go up on the aircraft on his video feed before I saw it positively lock up <laughs> on, the, on, on the telemetry. And um, it's, it's kind of that pressure, like you say, that everybody is watching. And, and really, it's, it's like watching a Formula One race or an IndyCar race. They're not watching for you to win. <laughs> they want you to screw up, because that's, that's when people can really sort of get out there and go, oh, yeah, they, they messed up. So, yeah. But to kind of tie that back to be, what it's like the, to, to be a test pilot and kind of, you know, smashing the, uh, the, the, the dream of what it really is, you know, think people think a test pilot, oh, I'm just going to, it's a brand new airplane, I'm just going to hop in and go and fly it and, and see what happens. It's not like that at all. There is <clears throat> no. hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months of planning for a 20 minute flight. Yep, absolutely. And then days and maybe even weeks of analysis after that flight so that we understand what happens so that the next one can be even better. Yep. And nothing, nothing happens by chance. It is all deliberate planning uh, because you need to know everything that's gonna happen to the best of your ability before you go out and, and step, step to your flight. Yep, absolutely. And thanks for that one because <clears throat> that's a good segue into, uh, into something I was gonna talk to Turbo about. Um, so Turbo, tell us about the hat trick on the <laughs> F-35. <laughs> So, um, so hat trick, interesting because obviously there's a 
reference to the number three in there. And I always thought that hat trick came from hockey here in the USA. Uh, found out because we had Brits on our team that there's also a hat trick in cricket, which I completely don't understand. Cause again, <laughs> never understood the game. Can't fathom watching something that takes days to play. But anyway, uh, so this number three kept coming up in the program. There, you know, there were going to be three versions of the airplane. There were three objectives in that concept demonstration phase that the contractors had to go out and prove that was going to be a critical part of the source selection criteria. So we, we kind of wrapped our minds around, hey, we like this term hat trick. And when it came to um, the airplanes, they each ended up with uh, slightly different tail flashes. And the hat trick theme was incorporated into those. Our call signs were hat trick. And then uh, if we're going to talk about the Mission X flight, uh, there were there were three things in that flight as well. Yep. There was the short takeoff, the level supersonic dash, and the vertical landing. And consider it a hat trick because we were going to do all three of those in the same flight. <clears throat> as far as our research told us at the time, nobody else had done that before. If they did do it before, nobody else bothered to video it or write it down. So, uh, and it was something that would be able to prove that the Stovall version, the short takeoff and vertical landing version of the airplane could do all the things that it was required to do. And the other piece that made it a little bit special for the X-35 team is we were going to accomplish this at Edwards Air Force Base in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's been around an airplane, a jet airplane that can hover, realizes the things it doesn't like is hot weather and high altitude. And we were going to go prove that not only could the airplane do it, but it could go do it in that environment. Right. Um, so uh, I always thought, and like you have mentioned, that, hey, all these first Big first things, that's the contractor pilot's domain. And we were fine with that. We understood that we were going to get to go do our own piece of that. We're, hey, the contractor pilot, do it. Then you'll go do it. Give your evaluation comments, which was great. So I'll, I don't think any of us on the government team expected that the Mission X flight was going to be one of us. <clears throat> I am uh, in the room at Edwards Air Force Base in the rooms we were using. And I knew that I was gonna be the person flying the next day. So I went out and found the test conductor who was also a Brit, Paul Bloxham. And I said, hey, do you have the test cards ready? And he said, hey, I'm, st I'm just getting ready to print them out, come back in about 20 minutes and I'll have them. So I went out and got a coffee, came back and he hands me the deck of test cards. And I start flipping through the test cards and I get to the overview page and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my God, this is the Mission X profile. And I look it up him at him and he's got this big smile on his face. <laughs> and I said, are they really gonna let me do this? And he's like, looks that way. I go, oh my goodness. Uh, okay, uh, by this time, it, I don't know, it was you know four in the afternoon or something. The brief was gonna be the next morning at five o'clock. And I said, well, not only were we trying to do those three things in that flight, but because we were trying to maximize every minute of flight time in the airplane, there were three other test points and trying to get all those done on the one tank of gas was going to be a bit of a challenge. So, hey, I want to go practice this in the simulator. So I called down to the Lockheed facility down in Palmdale, which is about a 45 minute drive from Edwards. I said, hey, can you guys let me in the sim to practice? I'm doing the Mission X flight tomorrow. And they're like, yeah, you're going to get here after things. So just come in the back door and we'll, we'll stay with you as long as you want. And they did. I, you know, God bless those guys. They stayed with me that night till I was comfortable that I had it down in my mind. We went into the profile, ran through several what ifs of, of how I might be able to <clears throat> maybe vector from one thing to another thing if something didn't go well in between. And then went back, uh, Went to sleep, got up the next morning. And the interesting thing about where we were at Edwards is uh, as you were coming uh, from off base, you drive, you get all the way to the back where all the hangars were, and you'd have to crest this hill. And as you crested the hill, you would get your first glimpse of the hangar and the apron. And if the airplane was outside, that was a good sign, right? Because they knew, <laughs> all right, it, whatever happened last night was good. It made it through all the maintenance checks. It's ready to go because it's sitting outside. So I came over the hill keep my like opened one eye thinking that might be better to absorb what was going to happen and yeah it's outside it's all good we go in uh, we brief and i'm walking out to go get my uh, flight gear on and i'm walking alongside our government lead engineer because he's going to the control room i'm going to get my flight gear on 
And he looks over at me and we'd known each other for a while. And he's like, Turbo, what's wrong? You're not your usual mm -hmm. joking self. I said, hey, man, this is Mission X. This is a lot riding on it. You mentioned everybody watching. Well, there was everybody and 10 more people that were going to be right. watching this flight. And I said, dude, this is Mission X. And, and he, he looked at me and he paused. And he said, well, just remember, Turbo, they taught monkeys how to fly spaceships. <laughs> and, and in that moment, I mean, it was, it was joking in the moment. Like, yeah, okay, I, I'm, maybe I'm taking this way too, way too serious. Um, but went out and we uh, got in the airplane and everything kind of flowed smoothly. Got to the runway and I'm, I'm trying to stay focused. This, I'd been in the airplane a couple of times before because we had been doing a build-up approach to get to this. I had, so I had done all of these elements. I had done the short takeoff. I had done the vertical landing. I had done the up and away flying before. But this is the first time we're going to put them all together. And I'm trying not to look because there's just people lining both sides of the runway. There's cameras out there. Just okay, focus on the task. Take off, climb. Do it. And the task, the, the mission was very, very busy. But there was probably about a 15 second stretch. Um, got to supersonic, level, uh, settled in a Mach 1.05, and they needed to collect data. So they wanted me to dwell there for as long as I could, which given the run was probably going to be about 15 or 20 seconds. And in that 15 to 20 seconds, all I had to do was keep the airplane going in the direction it was mm -hmm. going. And that was my time to kind of go. So here I am, I'm over the dry lake bed at Edwards going supersonic in an X airplane like other people have done in the decades prior. And that was the point where it kind of hit me like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this is pretty cool. Um, and then it was back into to getting everything ready, came back, landed on the flight. Um, and then yeah, there's another story about what we tried to do next, but we might save that for, for another time. For another time. That's awesome. Thanks, Turbo. I think um, one of the things you touched on, you know, through that is something that resonates throughout flight test, and that and that's the teamwork uh, and the leadership, and and maybe let's cage that in terms of staying inside your mission bubble. Um, talk about the mission bubble, guys. So, how do you approach it? What what is the mission bubble? I don't know. What do you what do you mean by the, the we, mission bubble? When you go into that preparation for getting ready to for a mission mm. the pre-brief getting into the brief getting your head straight so that you can go hit all those test points within a 15 second window yeah. without somebody like me in the back of the airplane usually going trim trim <laughs> get on trim uh you know, that sort of thing so how yeah, do you, yeah, how okay. do you approach that mission bubble and and how do you get the team and and the leadership and and the rest of the team just caged around you so that everybody's inside that mission bubble so I'll preface, the, preface this with uh, a follow on question I was going to have for Turbo of, you know, do those um, the nerves, the butterflies, et cetera, start to fade a little bit, the more of those kind of high intensity flights you do where there's lots of people watching uh, or, or how do you manage that? Um, but I think, you know, like what we learned from our Mark Zero campaign and what we kind of talked about a little bit earlier uh, before the podcast is is the same thing we do for every flight, right? We do the, the proper, you know, planning and, and uh, the mission planning and uh, training and things for that ahead of time. And then at brief time, you hack your watch and you make sure that everyone's there and you have all of your materials and you go through the brief like you have hundreds of times before in a methodical uh, way. And, and very quickly, it, it feels normal. Like this is right. This is, um, even though the, the content of the mission may be different, I'm, I'm putting myself in the right, uh, state of mind by going through talking about, you know, weather, uh, and THAs and the range and all the other administrivia. And here's the details, uh, of the mission that we're about to go do. And I would like you, uh, collecting this information and you got this and you got this, and here's what I'm going to provide. Here's what I'm going to say. And we've practiced that a number of times. Okay, any questions? Yes, we go back and forth a little bit. Uh, and by this point, we're, our mind is, is now kind of uh, set and caged. And, and there's probably moments in there, uh, Turbo, like you just described, uh, that we've had before, um, where, you're, where you can kind of pause for a second and you're like, yeah, this is pretty cool. <laughs> um, 
and then you're kind of right back into it, you know, focusing on, on what you're doing. Um, so I, I think maybe that's what you mean by like yeah. the mission bubble of yeah. like we have that, that kind of set tempo and process uh, that puts us in the right state of mind. Um, and, you know, a part of that is identifying in yourselves uh, and others out loud of, hey, uh, yeah, you know, last couple of nights, uh, baby's been up uh, crying and, and um, a little bit shorter on sleep. So, dude, if you see me glazing over, like call me out on it right away um, because we can't have that during the mission. Uh, and so being able to share uh, kind of vulnerably, vulnerably some of those things amongst the test team are, are good and expected. Sure. Yeah, I think there's the, so there's the individual piece where you have to be able to compartmentalize, right? It's a word pilots and test pilots throw out a lot. So I'd be able to take all those distractions in life and put them someplace for the, for the hour and a half or whatever it's gonna be that I'm gonna go do this thing. So that's the individual piece, but I think there are occasions, and some of the stuff we did with X thirty five was in that in that kind of area where there's there's distractions you just can't do anything about. Okay, there's a film crew from PBS that wants to be in the brief doing that, and how do you not let the cameras and these people and the microphones and everything be a distraction? But you have to have thought about it, and figured okay, here's here's where we want you, here's what we do, here's where we're going to ask you to step out because we're going to go do something now where it needed to just be us. And that was usually the, when we got to the brief with the test crew and the safety chase crew and said, okay, this is us. We're going to go do our pilot stuff here. Some of these we'll let you in because they're lower threat, lower risk type things. But some of these we needed to have that be an isolated compartmentalized thing. So I think there's a little bit of the personal piece and then figuring out in that group setting what's right and you need to have you know you as the test pod have are you're trying to manage more your personal piece you've got to have those others who are involved in the operation there to do like you said to be that cross check and you know when we were flying the airplanes cross country um i was sitting in fort worth and we're waiting for good weather at all of our diverts mm -hmm. and literally every five minutes a different vice president or two stars walking. It, did you check the weather? Like, okay, I just checked it five minutes ago. And, you know, I, yeah, I took meteorology a long time ago, but it, what I remember, it doesn't change that fast. And it's like, I needed somebody to help. Hey, can you just manage that for me while I'm trying to do all this other stuff I've got to do yeah. to get ready to fly? And then that person said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'm at the door and just, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell them the updates so that they don't have to keep coming in. Like, perfect, that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think if you, um, you know, if, if you're if you're observing it from like the day of the brief and you, you look at it, it's like this amazing team, like they create this bubble and they work together so cohesively, but it's it doesn't start that day. Right. Like the, the way that you create this this bubble that you're talking about is for the weeks and months leading up to it. This is a team that has worked together and has practiced in the sim and has come, gone in late nights and, and rehearsed it over and over and over again. And like to the point where you almost know what that person's going to think or say before they before they do it. Mm -hmm. So that by the time you get to the day of the actual mission, it's it's doing the things that you have to do in order to be you know safe and legal. Um, but like you, you almost you're almost at the point where you, you don't even need to because you've done it so many times. You know everything that that that, yep. that needs to be done. And now it's just. All right, now it's now it's time to actually execute on this on this last. Yeah, this yeah, last it's kind of like having a, a really strong crew, uh, like on the B fifty two, a crewed airplane. Yeah. You know things are going really well when it's really quiet, and right. everyone knows just the the exact moment when to speak and when not to speak and what to say and what you're listening for. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I think uh, in in my case, I think the uh, the time when I knew uh, this was on the first flight that we gelled together as a crew. Uh, was on a stall test point and um, we, we trimmed the airplanes in trim and uh, you know we're at 1.13 v stall and it's like every, all the numbers are matching everything's great co-pilot's looking good test pilot's looking good flight test engineer really looking good and <laughs> uh, and it's like okay here we go you know one knot per second decel so we start deceling at one knot per second and it's like i'm looking down and i'm taking my notes and i know the airplane's on the stall because i can feel it it's starting to go and then all of a sudden i look up and the test pilot and the co-pilot both got bottles of water in their hand, and so have I, because we know the airplane's going to push. It's got to push air, it's, it's going to push over, and it's going to go negative G. So it's like any time in three, two, one, now let go of the water, and the water just goes floating up, and the airplane <laughs> comes down. It's like, yep, got it. <laughs> and it was at that point when, you know, just like you're right inside that bubble, you know you're jailed as a crew, uh, but it's the practice, it's everything that goes up to that point that gets you to that, you know? So it's, 
yeah, it's great fun, and uh, but it's a lot of work to get there, as you said. Absolutely. Over. <clears throat> so very cool. Um, we talked about the X35 Turbo. Uh, we can't talk about the X35 without talking about the X32 as well. Uh, and a dear friend of ours was was one of those two test pilots on the X32. Um, so. Can you tell us a bit about the competition with the X32 and, and why do you think the, the F35 ultimately beat out the, the X32? But you've seen pictures of both, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've seen pictures of both and, and then I've seen pictures of both pilots. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, both of the better looking of those two are on the same team, but I'll let... Um, <laughs> um, no, we actually got told at one point because the comments on the looks of the airplanes were starting to get out of hand. We got told by our leadership to cease and desist all comments about the looks of the airplane, since that was not going to be a factor in the decision, uh, supposedly. Uh, so I, th I think the first thing to say is, you know, being involved in a fly-off. First of all, there's the okay. I'm involved in an X airplane, which doesn't happen very often, which is great. But now I'm involved in a fly-off between two of them. And so there was something that was, you know, even more unique about that. The, I think what it, the drive and the pace that that brought to the test was, you know, each side was trying to keep pace with the other. And if you look like significant event, first flights happened within 30 days of each other. First hovers happened within 24 hours of each other. It's amazing that two teams on independent pass um, ended up being sort of that closely matched, but I think each team was sort of driving the other to, right. to keep going fast, to keep working as best they could to meet those milestones as close in time as possible so that the other person didn't gain some sort of advantage of, oh, we did that up, you know, two months ago and you're just getting to that today. Uh, it was unique in that the government team started out supporting both contractors. So we, uh, we would go to the Lockheed places, we would go to the Boeing places, we were in the Sims for both airplanes. And as the designs became more mature, it started to become obvious that, hey, they're, they're different. Um, it's probably, and we're not gonna have enough time to train people in both. So we talked about, well, we're gonna let the contractors do most of the flying and then the government pilots will each come in and do a few flights in both and do a compare. That was one option or we're going to split the government team and some are going to go with boeing and some are going to go with lockheed and you'll each write your reports and that'll go to another group who's going to make the decision and that's what we ultimately ended up doing um, so uh, the contractors were kind of separated they didn't really exchange much although i will say when it came to anything related to flight safety the contractor chief test pilots talked mm -hmm. which was a great thing um, but the government team, uh, when we weren't in our contractor spaces, our government office together. So I sat next to my counterpart, Jeff Carnes, uh, in, you know, he was in this cubicle, I was in that cubicle. And we would come in, like, so what'd you get to do today? <laughs> oh, what'd you get to do today? And we, we could share stuff back and forth, which was great because that helped us, I think, both be a little bit more prepared for yeah. what we were going to go do. And then just to understand the broader perspective, because at the end of the day, um, what we were hoping for is the best airplane to win. We didn't care if it was the one we were supporting or not. What we cared about was the best airplane was going to go to the future Marines, airmen, sailors, international folks that are going to go mm -hmm. fly it. That's what mattered at the end of the day. Yeah. So I think while there was that competition that kind of paced things and drove sort of time stuff, uh, I think the healthy part of that was we all realized that the, at the end of the day, we wanted the best airplane to right. be the one that went Right, forward. absolutely. Very cool. Yeah, um, I think it's it's interesting as well, given what we're talking about with, with different airplanes being uh, capable of doing the different missions. Uh, it, it, it resonates with what we're trying to do here at Hermes, um, certainly on the on the Mission X kind of stuff. Trying to make an airplane that can take off and land at relatively low speed, and then accelerate all the way through to Mach five, and then come back down to zero again. It's it's. It's not easy. Uh, if it was, I think more people would have tried to have done it. Um, and I know certainly from from uh, what Wigby and Nova and Sally are doing, that it's not easy to pilot. Um, so I guess, how uh, how do we see ourselves developing in, in the same way, you know, maybe Wigby and Nova, in the same way that uh, Lockheed had their challenges and with the X-35, how do you see our challenges emerging? 
I, you know, I think uh, our challenges continue to emerge, you know, just on purpose, right? The more the, the more time that we spend uh, in the design reviews, in the sim, uh, and, and this is why uh, a big reason this as well as trying to increase the speed of the development of I just put standing blocks on my calendar every Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the morning. I'm in the sim for at least an hour and it's been great over the last month or so. Uh, I've got a TC or two or three or another pilot uh, with me. Uh, and so it, it kind of helps grow the team. And as you know, we, we try something like, whoa, didn't think it was going to do that. And then, you know, we, we pause and we turn around and look at the engineer. Hey, why to do that? Or why is this, um, you know, display acting in this way? And we can get that immediate feedback. Um, and then the other way that, you know, the things come out is, you know, as we continue to have increasing uh, level of fidelity in our design reviews, um, you know, there's, it's great that there are enough of us uh, within the flight test team that are dialed in and in the room that uh, we were like, hey, wait a minute, that, that thing you just said doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, can we pull the string on that a little bit and then, you know, come to find out, uh, yeah, I think we might need to adjust our plan or, or help me learn how maybe as a team or a pilot, I'm going to need to compensate for that in order to still have a successful mission. But I mean, it's just, it's through that interaction and you've just got to dive in. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's building a brand new airplane has challenges. Building an airplane that's un, unmanned has challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, building an airplane that eventually is going to go Mach 5 has challenges. And we're, we're combining them all, right? So right. Um, what I think we have as a huge advantage, though, at, at least from my perspective, um, uh, compared to back when I was doing government side flight tests, is the the relatively small size of this company uh, is allows us to iterate super quickly. Like we'll get in the sim, we'll, we'll, we'll fly something and we'll say, gee, I wish it could do X, Y, and Z. And the next week that thing is, is, is right. done. Right. And, and, and that allows us to, to iterate and, and come up with hopefully an ideal design way faster than, mm -hmm. than we could do. Yeah. I know there's stuff that we talked about this morning in our sim that's going to hit for you know, us to fly by Friday. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that if, you know, I go around, I talk to different groups and one thing I tell them, because I, I use that experience from the X-35 test team. So how, how do we go take something and do something that had never been done before? In a short period of time from, you know, from first flight to mission X was less than 30 days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I tell people it's you have individuals who have confidence, cleverness, courage, mm -hmm. and commitment. And if you have people that have those attributes and you have leaders who know what to do with that and what to do for that, you can accomplish anything. I mean, that's the hard part. The technical stuff, we got smart people that can figure that out. And it's just time sometimes to get to those things to resolve. And if you have people and teams like that and leaders who know how to deal with that, you can accomplish anything. Sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think one of the things we talked about uh, earlier on was, was the difference in design philosophy between uh, the Harrier and, and the F-35 and how you approach um, the design aspects of that. And, and we, we were talking about the Harrier is a handful. Uh, and everybody I've ever talked to is basically, you know, you're, you're trying to balance this manually controlled airplane on a column of noise. Um, whereas with the F-35, it's much more electronic. There's much more um, code in, in between you and the, and the engines or the, the flight controls. Um, where I'm going with this, eventually we're going to get to a point where the airplane is autonomous and we see autonomy coming in more and more. We talk more about machine learning and more about um, AI. How do you see autonomy affecting aircraft in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think we're, you know, the technical pace of autonomous capability is on its, you know, it's marching down its path. And there are some folks who are trying to figure out how does that align with the humans and the interaction between the two. But I don't think there's enough folks working that piece of it. Um, I mean, you look at today, I, I'm a test pod engineering background, so I should know better. But 
when I type in a destination in Google Maps on my phone or I punch it into the car's nav, it says, turn right in one mile. I, okay, I'm going to go turn right in one mile, right? I don't, what I should be doing is pull back, zoom out. Let me see. Well, that doesn't look like a route that makes sense to get there because I've done that drive before. I know, oh, I don't want to go through Atlanta at that time, whatever the case may be. Um, I should be doing that, but I'm trusting the autonomy because the past 20 times I did it, it was fine. Right. And I think that's the piece where where we see problems occur is the one time the autonomy, for whatever reason, whether it's because of a poor design or because it's doing exactly what it was supposed to do, but we humans didn't think enough to realize it could do that or it was going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the piece. So I, I hope that whatever track this autonomous thing goes down, there are still the people who are trying to figure out how to have that intersection between the humans and the autonomy. So we do get the best thing in the end, right? The, the two of those things working synergistically together to give me the best or the safest or whatever that may be. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a certain level of decision making that, you know, you want to allow autonomy to do for you and to alleviate workload uh, and allow us to make some higher level uh, decisions uh, about the, the zoomed out picture. Um, things that, you know, from our experience of, yes, the, the algorithm may tell us to turn right, but we know it's better to turn left this time of day or with this weather uh, kind of a thing. And so I see it as a good workload uh, relief effort. Um, and, and I think there's multiple layers uh, of that available. Um, but still allowing, like you said, a good synergistic effect of allowing the, the autonomy and the human to work together to find the, the best path forward. Super focused on autonomy. And the, yeah, the, 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 the challenge for us as test pilots is, you know, physics are still physics. You still need to flight test the airplane regardless of what the autonomy is. Uh, and so the challenge then just becomes for us, okay, how do we do what is standard flight test practices with these layers of autonomy and we you know we've had to i had to do that like back when we were doing like envelope expansion for crosswind landings for for global hawks right. and you know when you're when you're doing a normal landing on a for, for you know in a manned airplane it's easy you, you know you wait until the crosswinds are right and you just do a landing and then you land and you get the data but like setting that all up with these extra layers of autonomy between the pilot and the and the aircraft that's that's where the challenge is and you still have to do that um and then operationally too just like you said um sometimes you need to like take that step back and realize that maybe the autonomy, if it's not helping you, you need to figure out a way to, to, to turn it off if that's even an option. And like, you know, the example they always gave us when I, or the year that I flew for the airlines was, oh yeah, hey, you got traffic and it's gonna be a conflict in like 30 seconds. Oh, let me figure out how to change the heading or the altitude mode. Like, no dude, turn off the autopilot, fly the airplane. Yeah. So the, the, the challenge for, for pilots in general is um, if, we, if we have all this autonomy, that's great. We just need to make sure that the the underlying skill set of being a pilot that knows how to fly an airplane uh, is not negatively affected to the point where they can't you, you can't fly without an, right. the autonomy solution. Yeah, and I think you know we as humans, I mean, shame on us because we ought to know what bad autonomy mm -hmm. outcomes look like because we've seen enough science fiction movies to tell us <laughs> how that goes. So we ought to know better. We ought to be doing the right things to say, hey, we understand how to uh, merge those two, how yeah. to merge the humans and the autonomy together to get the outcome we want. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Open the plug bay doors now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this, is a, this is a question for, for you guys, and, and I know pilots hate to talk about this sort of thing, so Us? you guys, all of you, all three of you, uh, I know we don't pilots hate, talking hate to about talk about this yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> what is an aircraft that you wish you had flown um, and you never have, but you'd really love to. So I, I think I'm supposed to say the Halcyon picture. You got to know that. <laughs> that would be the right, the smart move here, right? Uh, I mean, this is like the question of what's your favorite airplane, right? For folks who had been fortunate enough to fly many. I, th I, I think for me, I'd, I'd have to go back is the, the airplane that started me on the path when I was a kid, when I, the first one I saw where I went, wow that would be cool was the F-104 Starfighter. Mm. And and I don't know, something about that sleek design or whatever, but, uh, and I was I was this close to getting a ride in one and then something happened with the 
ejection seat wall in the airplane and the government wouldn't support it until they got that resolved and my time window passed. But I think that would be one that I just just to make that ultimate sort of connection back to the childhood me of realizing, OK, that was kind of a dream back then before I really understood where I wanted to go and what was going to be possible. So I think it'd be the 104. I, uh, so, I mean, I, I flew fourth gen uh, fighters operationally, F-16, F-15. And then in test pilot school, we got to fly a couple of like first gen stuff, like the MiG-15 and even some like World War II, like the T-6 and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like the, the generation that I missed out on was like third gen area, you know, like Vietnam. So like all the Century Series and especially the F-4. Uh, so for me, uh, I think I would love to fly the F-4 or, or something of that era. Because? Because it's just, it's like... I mean, the F-4 in itself is proof that, I mean, you can, you can get a brick to fly as long as you put enough thrusties behind <laughs> right. it, right? And just, I think that uh, part of it is just the nostalgia, like, oh man, you know, F-4, Robin Olds, you know, back yep. in the day kind of stuff, speaking of, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I, I think just, I think, it's, I think it'd just be an interesting airplane to fly based, you know, and the F-4 is also like, a, from a test pilot perspective, it's a lesson in like, <laughs> all, the, all these things like, all right, hey, let's change, you know, the, let's change the, the, the dihedral. And that means now we have to change the anhedral of the tail, which means we now have to, and all these like random right. things, like it's a Frankenstein jet because every time they change one thing that, and I think it'd just be an interesting thing to fly from that perspective yeah. as well. But part of it is just like, the, uh, you know, let's just go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think I'm on uh, kind of both ends of the spectrum of, of kind of new and old. And I think one I can actually do, um, I didn't get the chance in test pilot school uh, to do the P-51. Uh, and they do have one here at the Confederate uh, Commemorative Air Force yeah. down uh, south of uh, Atlanta. Um, but the other one would be either like an F-22 or F-35. Now, we had a chance to like do the Sims uh, during test pilot school. But I think, you know, from my multi-place, you know, bomber background of, you know, having the, the opportunity for that single seat fighter, uh, you know, supersonic, you know, fifth gen type uh, of operation. I think that would be uh, an amazing experience as well. Um, I think the only other single seat um, chance I had was the A-10 during test pilot school, which is still currently my favorite airplane to have flown. Uh, you know, best 2.2 uh, I've had. So <laughs> 200, 200 rounds on the gun and six bombs, and it was awesome. You know, speaking, speaking of bombers, I'll add one more thing. I'm, I'm right now in the middle of watching uh, Masters of the Air right. uh, and, like, watching, like, the, 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 the B-17 guys mm -hmm. go through there. Like, dude, that, that would be a fun. And there's, there's a bunch of those flying around, too. Like, that'd be, that'd be yeah. kind of cool to fly one and, of those. And I think that's what I also really enjoy about kind of the older generation because it is fly-by wires, right? You can, <laughs> you can feel the air and the airplane and, and how it's, you know, responding to you and the air that it's in. Uh, which is kind of why I really enjoyed flying the T-37 and, and doing acro with it because you could you could really sense, you know, the, the airplane talking to right. you. Yeah, that's very cool. Actually, it's funny you should mention the Masters of the Air. Uh, back when I was a very young airman, um, first base, it was an F-4 base uh, in the UK, but it also, it's the home of the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. And uh, they said, does anybody want to come and fly in the Lancaster? And uh, it was like, you know what? No, I think I'm going to go out and have a couple of beers instead. And to this day, I regret it. It was my, and my buddy came back and he's like, "Yeah, you know, I just got to sit in the tail end of a uh, of a Lancaster and go flying around in the you know tail end Charlie." And I was like, "Yeah, probably should have done that." Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not one of the ones I wish I'd flown, but it's like, yeah. "Oh man, I wish I had." Yeah. So that was very cool. Um, so Turbo, um, long and illustrious career, uh, and still pushing through on the flight test safety stuff. What are you up to these days? Uh, so mostly trying to stay retired this time and get this one right. Uh, my wife works, so I do all the house management stuff. But I have the flight test safety podcast that I host uh, once a month. I have my own YouTube channel where I kind of let the left side of my brain run amok and do stuff that's fun. And you know, I, I, every time I go speak to uh, a group or an organization, I always wear a superhero shirt and I explain to people, is, no, I don't think I'm a superhero. I don't have any, I can't fly. I don't have a cool suit that does all kinds of stu cool stuff. Uh, but I, I really believe in the concept of trying to make the world a better place. So I sort of charge myself with the task of, hey, okay, your job to go try and make the world a better place. And uh, if I can do that one middle school class at a time or one company at a time, and if, even if I only reach two or three individuals, 
that's two or three more than yesterday and just, you know it's just a long way to go till i get everybody sure <laughs> but you're on the way yeah excellent thanks turbo all right well it's been great talking with you guys today uh, turbo thanks. nova wigby thanks very much and uh, over and out great thanks thanks for having me